Pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Anna Gomez. Uh, please come on up. And Anna practices EMDR. How many of you have heard of EMDR? Lots and lots of you, that's great. Please come on up. Probably because it's an evidence based practice, so that tends to get more, more airtime, right? But what I love about Anna particularly is that Anna's been bringing this work to her native South America. So she has a focus on Latino populations and most of the time the people who show up to our conferences also have a, a background, people of color and lots of people who also who have Latin American heritage. So that seemed like a good fit. And also Anna works uh, with children. And you can find some of her books at our bookstore specifically the books that she has written to help children understand what this process is. So first and foremost, thank you, Luis, and thank you. I want to thank the whole team that um, has made this possible. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this incredible conference. So I'm here to talk about EMDR therapy. I am a therapist, trainer, but mostly I'm a human being that is in recovery. I think all of us in, in this planet, in some form, experience some form of trauma and adversity. I chose psychotherapy as part of my path of healing. Um, that was my way of, um, probably a non-conscious way of seeking healing because most of us believe in the beginning that we just want to help everybody. And as much as that's true, we choose this path as a way of healing ourselves and how wonderful it is that as we help ourselves we can also help others so this is part not only of an intellectual journey but as a, it's a journey as a human being and I found EMDR so I'm grateful for that being trained by Francine Shapiro she's been my mentor my teacher and I want to tell you briefly how EMDR began so Francine Shapiro the developer of EMDR therapy can you hear me well yeah, I probably need a little bit. Well, how about how about this? Yes, okay, yay. Um, so Francine Shapiro was here in California, and she was having disturbing thoughts and disturbing feelings because she had just been diagnosed with cancer. And out of the blue, she started to move her eyes back and forth, back and forth, and she started to have a sense of relief. The disturbances started to decrease, and she started to feel better. So she tried again. She moved her eyes back and forth, and then she felt better, and the disturbances started to decrease. So she went back to um, her research center and started to practice with her patient. And she started to see that the same thing was happening, that all the patients and clients were saying, you know, this memory seemed kind of far, this memory seemed kind of distant, and they're not disturbing anymore. And she started to create a whole approach, which I think is amazing, since 1987, she started to develop a full psychotherapeutic approach that is called now EMDR. If it was up to her, she will change the name. We're like AT&T, you know, we're stuck with the name. Even though she will change the name now, because now the name is EMDR, Eyes move, Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. She will call it a reprocessing therapy because this form of therapy really is about integration. It's about finding freedom. It's about healing. And I have the first few slides, a little bit boring, but I want you to see the evidence that supports EMDR. So we have multiple studies, some of them randomized, which means, you know, that you randomly assign people to a control group or experimental group. So some receive EMDR, some don't, and then they compare the two groups. So it's been substantially researched. In the beginning, you can imagine a form of therapy that has to do with eye movement. You know, Bruce Perry says that the brain 
is a very uh, conservative organ. <laughs> I believe that. And when we're facing such a novel stimulus like eye movement, we start to be suspicious about this form of therapy. That's kind of weird that in, you know, in a therapeutic approach, you, you, you move your eyes back and forth or use what we call bilateral stimulation, which we can do it through tapping back and forth. We're tapping. Um, and when I went to get trained as a therapist, I was very suspicious about it, very skeptical, didn't believe it. But you know what happens during the training is that in the afternoon, we have to practice. And we have to practice with our own memories. So I thought, you know, I'm here between colleagues. I'm going to choose something really tiny, something that you know, doesn't bother me that much. Well, 10 minutes down the road, I'm bawling and crying. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> And from that point on, I decided to dive into the use of EMDR therapy. I specialize in, in complex trauma, dissociation. I work with people of all ages, but especially children and adolescents. Because if we can work with this population, we can work with kids. I mean, I think about my own childhood. I'm not a survival of sexual abuse, but I'm a survival of life. I have experienced trauma, and I have experienced significant adversity. And if, when I look back, if I had a helper, a therapist, that, that could have been my companion, that could have helped me find healing and integration, you know, my life would, have been, would not have been as rocky, for instance. So this is why I'm so passionate about working with children. If we can help them now, imagine the suffering that we're going to prevent them from. So here are, going back to research studies, is being uh, compared to Prozac. And you know, of course, EMDR therapy is the yellow bar. And it shows clearly that it's significantly and more efficient and effective than, than medication. Um, there are multiple um, studies with, you know, with children, with adolescents, with adults, with personality disorders, with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and, you know, of course, we need more research now, especially in the work with complex trauma and dissociative individuals. So EMDR therapy, I'm going to show you here. Who has given the stamp to EMDR as an evidence-based approach? The most important stamp that we received was from the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization has given the stamp as an evidence-based approach and it, the recommendation to only two approaches for post-traumatic stress disorder. And EMDR is one of those two approaches for PTSD. Here is a list for you to read. I'm not going to go through this in depth. Um, but here are some other organizations that have given EMDR the stamp of approval as an evidence-based approach. OK, here's more. But let's dive into the meat of this. Let's talk about the core and center of EMDR therapy. So what happens when we experience trauma? When, what happens when we experience adversity? And we're going to talk later on about what trauma is, you know, because we tend to think that a traumatic event is only, let's say, abuse um, or an accident or um, being significantly bullied. But there are many other forms of trauma that remain invisible to all of us. Think about neglect, for instance. It's not what was done to us, but what didn't happen. The love I didn't receive, the hug that I didn't get, the mirroring that I didn't receive. Because, you know, the self does not develop in isolation. The self develops, you know, through a, the relationship with the other. And when I am invisible and I don't exist, that creates deep and significant wounds. So memories of trauma and adverse events remain in the brain and the nervous system. So in your brain, you know, you have uh, 200 billion neurons, these little cells that are able to do so much. And one cell is able to connect about 10,000 times. So I want you to imagine the number of connections that exist in the brain. So pretty much everything that has happened to you is recorded somewhere in your nervous system 
and your brain. According to the adaptive information processing model, which is the core and center of EMDR, so all the psychological approaches have a lens. The lens for EMDR is what we call the adaptive information processing model. So Francine Shapiro said, you know what? We're geared towards health. We have a system in the brain that is in charge of taking information, processing information, assimilating and integrating such information. But when this structures in the brain that are in charge to do of doing that are inhibited, are blocked, then now they're not able to do the job. And these memories remain in raw form. They remain unprocessed. And when these memories become activated, they are turned on by the environment. Now the past becomes present. Now, and these are words from Shapiro, the I see the, the present through the lenses of the past. For instance, I work with significantly traumatized children. Let's, some of them get adopted. They go to a very safe environment, a loving place, but they carry the past inside. They carry the fear, the lack of safety inside. So even though externally there is safety, internally they live as if the past never left as if the abuse is still happening, the fear, the shame. And for a lot of these people, kids, teenagers, and adults, it's not just fear, but it's fear that interferes with the ability to embrace life, to connect, to form relationships. It's not just shame. It's traumatic shame. It's not just being embarrassed and ashamed about something, but it's this pervasive sense of shame that I'm not good enough that I'm defective, that I don't deserve love, that I am unlovable. See, that's the traumatic shame that a lot of our, our people with especially complex trauma come in with. And full of experiences and memories that they have now been able to integrate. The system, the, the brain, the nervous system has not been able to chew up, soar out, integrate such experiences. Um, so as you think about all these networks and networks and networks that contain information, some of the information may be very positive and adaptive. Some of the information may be maladaptive. So I'm going to tell you a quick story because according to Shapiro, health, and don't necessarily like the word pathology, but the clinical symptoms, the depression, the anxiety, the dysregulated anger, they're all, according to Shapiro, you know, a manifestation of the activation of such memories, okay? But health is also, according to Shapiro, in part, you know, the activation of memory networks that contain positive and adaptive information. So let me tell you a quick story. So I'm the youngest of my whole family. So we're six. And my parents didn't have children. You know, they have five and didn't have kids for nine years, and here I am. Then I come into the world. That set the stage for being the youngest and had a lot of positive and adaptive information story in my brain, but also set the stage for a lot of adversity as well. You know, loneliness, what is to grow in a family where everybody's bigger than you, right? So that can also be potentially traumatic. But one of the things that was very positive was that my sisters love to dance. I come from a culture, Colombia. Latin culture, we love to dance. So I dance from the moment I think I came out of my mom's womb, I swear. Um, so we dance and dance, but there's not such a thing as you have to dance in a certain style. You just dance, and it's okay. You dance for the joy of it. So I came to the United States 25 years ago, 25 years ago. And I have memory networks that contain very positive information about dancing. So I went to college. I had already done my undergraduate studies in psychology when I started to do my master's. And you know, you go out with your friends. None of them wanted to dance. I hear music, I jump in, I'm the first one to dance. Even if I'm, well, you notice that. <laughs> I, I'm not shy when it comes to dancing. But here's the thing, so the music, activates my own experiences associated with dancing, right? Which 
in the cognitive elements say, you're going to do well. You're going to be able to dance. You know, I have positive emotions associated with it. And then I have somatic responses. My body responds really well to music and dancing. However, I had some of my friends because they said, I said, hey, guys, you, you're not going to dance. And they said, no, I need a beer first to be able to do that. And I said, you know, I was puzzled by it. And I said, well, why? And she said, no, you know, they're going to make fun of me. Uh, they're going to laugh at me. I'm not going to do it well. I have two left feet, so there's no way that I can do that. And so think about, you hear the music. The music is the stimulus. But what is activated in the mind of my friend and what is activated in my mind is very different. And the product of it is very different. Me, I jump right away, start dancing, no problem. I'm the only one, and I'm wondering what's going on. Um, she's full of shame. She's full of, I will not be good enough. I will not dance good enough. I will not be good enough when I dance, right? So I want you to see how the stimulus, as simple as it is, music can activate so many networks that sometimes we may not be aware of because we have something that is called implicit memory. Implicit memory is a memory that is below awareness, hmm? that is more emotional and somatic connected to the body. And we're not consciously aware of it. So how many things become active and activated in us that we're not consciously aware of, OK? So um, in EMDR, for instance, who is EMDR therapy appropriate for? If it exists in memory, we use EMDR therapy. So unless it's an organic condition, then EMDR will be, could be the main approach. The question is, can be a main approach, can be an adjunct approach. For instance, if you were diagnosed with cancer, so EMDR may not be the main approach, but maybe an adjunct approach that will work with the diagnosis of cancer. That could be, for many people, highly traumatic, OK? Um, <clears throat> if it's true that we have such thing as organic, organic ADHD, which there is some research that shows that adversity in the first two years of life may be underneath the symptoms of ADHD. But let's say that there's organicity also. Um, then EMDR may be an adjunct approach because having attention deficit may make you prone to adversity and potentially traumatic events that exacerbate, that make the symptoms of ADHD even worse. Okay, so EMDR therapy can be an adjunct approach. So, Let's look at what else we can use EMDR with. <clears throat> Pretty much anything that has underneath trauma and adversity. Because the reality is, one of the things that we've learned um, in the last 20 years is that trauma and adversity is underneath every single disorder in the DSM. Most, I would say, most of the disorders in the DSM-5. When we look at a child with behavioral issues, you know, the first impulse of most, or I would say a lot of mental health professionals is med let's medicate this child instead of let's see what's underneath this behavioral problems. And very often with the children that I work with, underneath behavioral problems, what we find may be a chaotic family, a parent that is not emotionally attuned, that is not synchronized to the needs of the child, or an environment that is very rigid and traumatizing. And when we can get to the underlying issue, that is the, tra the traumatic event or the adverse event, and we can stimulate the information processing system in the brain, so that way this information can be moved to an adaptive resolution, then what we see is that the symptoms start to decrease. Okay. <clears throat> so for instance, this is a child that comes to um, my office with significant anxiety and separation anxiety. So as an EMDR therapist, I'm going to look at, of course, the psychosocial history. I'm going to look at the resources the child has. I'm going to work on restoring safety. Um, I'm going to do all that preliminary work. But eventually, I need to work on 
what's underneath. See, in EMDR therapy, initially we work on changing states. What does that mean? I'm going to help the child, the teenager, the adult, to go from a negative emotional state into a positive emotional state. So coping strategies, we're going to help these kids or teenagers or adults increase the capacity to cope, to modulate emotions to tolerate emotions and tolerate affect. So that's part of what we do. But eventually, our ultimate goal is to get to trait change. So eventually, what we want to do is to promote change in the trait, the anxiety. These are kids that have experienced anxiety so much that, as Perry says, a state becomes a trait right? Now it's just not a temporary state. Now I'm anxious all the time. So what do we see underneath the anxiety? Parental divorce, bullying, early experiences with caregivers. So here are caregivers that are caught up in what society is now, working, producing, accomplishing, dealing with the stressors of life. But these are parents that because of their own adversity couldn't connect to this child, couldn't provide the love, the care, the connection. And I would say the majority of the cases that I work with, it's not just the trauma the child experienced, but it's intergenerational trauma. That's what we see most of the times. How we passed what we haven't healed to the next generation. If we haven't integrated if we haven't made sense of our experiences, especially early experiences of attachment and connection, then, you know, you're probably aware of the adult attachment interview. You know, the adult attachment interview looks at how we have integrated our early experiences of attachment, and that will predict what kind of pattern of attachment I'm going to promote in my child. So it is amazing that you can use the adult attachment interview with a pregnant woman and predict what kind of pattern, what is the pattern of attachment this baby will have with this mother just based on how this mother has integrated or has come to organize her own early experiences of attachment. So now we know that unresolved trauma will predict in a very high percentage that if I haven't healed my own trauma, there is a high likelihood my child may have a disorganized attachment with me, an insecure disorganized attachment. Think about it. Hmm? So underneath this child's anxiety, we have a child with no connection, parents that were emotionally distant, parents also that were anxious themselves. So what happens when you have to grow up with a mother, for instance, that is anxious? To be with mother as a baby, I must share mother's anxiety because it is felt. It's a felt sense. So now this memory now becomes our memory and, be, and becomes procedurally stored in the brain. So now it's not a cognitive process, but it's a somatic process. I feel the anxiety. And I have clients that say, I don't know why I'm anxious. It's just free floating. It's just there. And sometimes it can become so, it can start so early in our lives. Just experiencing the fear and the anxiety of our caregivers. So imagine how much it is passed from one generation to the other. And this is one of my passions, intergenerational transmission of trauma, how we pass from generations what haven't been healed in this generation. So when we're working with a child, when we're helping the child heal, we are healing generations to come because this is a child that will become an adult, will become a parent, will become a mother that won't know how to connect, how to mirror this child, how to synchronize to the needs of this kid, OK? Um, so trauma kids began even in the womb. Now, we do know from the work of Yehuda, I think she was here, 
and she probably spoke to you about the changes that occur, that occur as a result of trauma and cortisol levels in the baby when the baby's born. Now, I think much more happens. We're not able to yet see the extent of what is passed from the mother into the baby epigenetically, okay? So here's what happens usually with a lot of the kids that I work with. So I want you to think about, this is one of the routes in which unresolved trauma can impact the relationship with the next generation. So let's say we have a mother here. This mother, you know, may become her own trauma, becomes activated by something simple. I mean, babies are amazing, but they're hard to take care of. You know, have you talked to uh, a parent that just had a baby? No sleep. And probably, do you remember when you had your first child, if you have children? No sleep. Child is crying. Needs a clean diaper, needs food. And you know, these daily routines can significantly activate these memory networks in the brain, all these neurons that contain information about her own unresolved trauma, okay? And so now, you know, inside this parents that wound, there is also a wounded inner child. And this is what, uh, one of the things that has helped me have compassion for the parents that I work with, because they carry a wounded younger self. And now, this woundedness become activated by whom? The closest relationship, especially the child. And what happens is, the baby, as wonderful as the baby may be, is going to activate memories of trauma, and activate cognitive, emotional, and somatic elements of the mother's traumatic events. So the I'm not good enough, the I'm defective, the shame, the I'm a bad parent, the fear, am I going to be able to do this? And the somatic reactions, the, the heart rate increases, stomach aches, um, and a bunch of you know, a whole bunch of responses that are, are activated in the body as a result of trauma being in a state of activation. So now the effective, effective communication between the child and the mother is interrupted. Hmm? Because now the child, the mother is not able to see, is not able to feel this baby and not able to respond Contingently. What does that mean? It's not able to respond in a way that, like, if you, I see you're feeling lonely, now I can hold you. The mother that is in trauma response is not able to see that that's what you need. And now we have a baby left with lots of, lots of unmet needs. And that's going to impact the biology as well, okay? So, for instance, you have, this is a mom that is being activated by the child's um, behaviors. What happens when trauma memories become activated? You go into what? Self-preservation. You go into survival mode. So, if you parent from survival, do you think that will work? Do you think that will help the child feel safe? What do you think? Would that promote a sense of safety in this baby? Hmm? Probably not, right? Because child, mother is not able to do what is so important in, in secure attachment, core regulation. I'm not able to be the thermostat that you need to connect, to regulate your internal states. And then we have caregivers that dissociate shut down. They also go to self-preservation. Some caregivers that go into self-preservation may go into shut down mode. Some go into, you know, becoming belligerent, aggressive, angry. Hmm? And we have now caregivers that become emotionally constricted and shut down or become belligerent and aggressive. And you know what? I've spent so many years of my life as a therapist, 25 years as a therapist, doing psychoeducation that later on parents were not able to use. You know why? <laughs> because they know it well in the higher smart brain, but 
once their trauma becomes activated, you know what happens? They're not able to utilize any of the things that I taught them. Hmm? Because when you go into survival mode, you're not going to utilize or this fancy strategies that we taught them. Okay, And this is why when I do EMDR therapy, I work very systemically. I'm working with the caregiver. I'm working helping the, child, the parent also be able to self-regulate, help the parent be able to modulate emotions, and then also helping the child. Okay, It's a systemic approach. So this is a quick study. I'm not going to go into this. But there are studies that show that mothers with violence-related PTSD may experience the child's routine distress as a trigger for pre-existing post-traumatic stress. Hmm? Okay, and now once the child grows up, now child also has those invisible traumas, traumas in general. And now what happens, there is a mutual activation of networks. So now the caregiver activates the memory networks that have not been integrated and vice versa. And now we see these dynamics that continue to enforce these memory networks. Hmm? So... We also must look at redefining trauma because trauma is not just, um, you know, abuse or accidents. That is significant trauma. But there is something that is called invisible trauma. The invisible trauma is, for instance, growing up with a parent that pressures to achieve because nothing you do is ever good enough. Or a parent that is never emotionally available, never connected never present, and you grow up emotionally alone. That is what has been called invisible trauma, that we must look within, and we must inquire if we work with people in the mental health field to also acknowledge the invisible traumas, the things that didn't happen, okay? So here are some of the things that EMDR has been used with. Post-traumatic stress, anxiety disorders, depression, um, relationship issues, addictions. Because think about addictions. What is underneath most people with addictions? And we're talking about not just substance abuse, but we're talking about addictive behaviors. We may be addicted to overachieving, for instance. Hmm? We may be addicted to work. That's an addiction. But underneath the addiction, most individuals with an addiction always say they have a sense of emptiness. Hmm? Is that emptiness that they carry from unresolved trauma and adversity. Chronic pain, the, the, the body at some point is going to express what the mind has not been able to. So very often we somatize. And now after, you know, I know Felitti was here and talked about the AC study, right? Looking at the connection between mind and body and starting to initiate, initiating the conversation of illnesses and unresolved trauma, okay? Behavioral problems, self-esteem issues. So those are things that we do work with EMDR, Okay. And the relationship, for instance, couples therapy, very often uh, people use EMDR in combination with uh, emotional focus therapy and many other therapies. Uh, so that way, the, the, the individuals that are part of this couple, they can work through their own experiences of trauma and then work as a couple with another therapist. So EMDR can be an adjunct approach that can be used with relationship issues. What happens in between the baby and the caregiver, very similar. Here, we have two adults that activate each other's unresolved trauma hmm? and continue to activate even their own attachment style. So you have one person that is very detached and distant, disengaged, and the other that is clingy and pursue is the pursuer, right? Because they have different attachment styles. They have different experiences with their own caregivers. And now they reenact it in their relationship. So if we don't get to the trauma, then they will continue to activate each other's memory networks. They contain unresolved experiences of trauma. Okay? So 
Let's look at closely in terms of how these memory networks are activated, okay? So for instance, let's look at the simple fear, public speaking. Hmm? So I had a client that came to me and said, I just, I'm terrorized of public speaking. So I said to her, let's look at that moment, that very moment when you stand in front of a group and you have anxiety and fear. And I said, so what is the worst part of it? And she said, to be just the image of seeing people in front of me. And what is the negative thought that you have about yourself? And then she said, that I'm not good enough. Hmm? And what do you feel? I feel shame. I feel fear. And where in your body you experience that? And she said, all over my body. So we went back. We do an EMDR, something that is called a float back. And I said, let's float back and go back to see when in your life you started to feel this way. Where the story began. And I found this in the internet, and I thought, it's just like my client, you know, a mother that always felt that she was not sophisticated enough, hmm? a father that always th thought, you don't know enough. Hmm? And now she carries a younger self that believes you can do it. So notice how the past interferes with our ability to embrace the present. So past becomes present. Hmm? The very thing that I want to leave behind is the thing that keeps me trapped, hijacked, you know, and I continue to see the present through the lenses of the past. So the goal of EMDR therapy is to promote the connection between neurons, networks, promote the integration of memory be able to stimulate the areas of the brain that can do that job and then link up all these memory networks so that way the brain can integrate it. Shapiro believes that because during the traumatic event we experience such strong emotions, those strong emotions block the brain from being able to do the job of chewing up, processing, integrating these mem memories, and now these memories remain frozen. So more than talking about trauma today, I want to talk about hope. I want to talk about a path towards healing. And that's what EMDR proposes and EMDR is about. So how do we do EMDR? I'm going to give you a little bit of what it looks like. We start with what we call client history. We, we understand our, per, the, our client. We gather information about the history. We understand what are the memories of adversity that continue to be reactivated in the present, okay? We then go into what we call preparation phase. This is kind of a phase of stabilization. We stabilize the client. We work on coping skills. We teach them about EMDR therapy, the things that we do in EMDR. So let, let's practice together some of the things that you do in EMDR. One of the things in EMDR therapy that is very different from any other form of therapy is what we call bilateral stimulation. Okay, so I'm going to invite you, the first form of bilateral stimulation is eye movement. So what I invite you to do is find the two corners, hmm? and I want you to move your eyes from one corner, look at one corner without moving your face, move one corner and the other, and one corner, there you go, back and forth. Not too long, because I don't want you to be activated, okay? But that's what we teach first, eye movement, okay? There are two types of eye movement that we do. One, which is slow and short, meaning only one, two, three, four times, okay? We use the slow, short sets for resources, things that are positive. Hmm? We use the fast and long, 24 to 36 and sometimes more, when the person is working on what is traumatic and negative, okay? There are other forms of BLS, which is tapping, OK? 
okay? The therapist can do tapping by doing this, back and forth. Hmm? And you can also do the bilateral stimulation by using something that is called the butterfly hug. So I'm going to invite you to do this. I'm going to invite you to put your, uh, your hand. There you go. And then you're going to alternate. There you go. That's a butterfly hug. Hmm? So let's try something. And if you are in current crisis or you think that you can quickly go into something traumatic, then don't do it. But I'm going to invite you to work on something positive. I want you to think about a place that feels calming and peaceful. It may be the beach. It may be the mountains. And it's nice and calming. It's a place where nothing bad has ever happened, right? Because, for instance, you may think about grandma's house that was so peaceful, but grandma is dead. So very likely, if you start by lot of stimulation, the networks communicate, and you may end up thinking about the loss of grandma. So when you have the image of that place, make a sensory-based picture of that, the colors, the sounds, and notice what you feel. Notice the feeling that you have when you're in that place. Notice if it's day or night. Notice if there is wind. Notice if you have other people, ideally people that are safe and calming. Notice where these feelings are in your body. And as you notice that, I'm going to invite you to do a butterfly hug. And you're going to tap back and forth. There you go. Now we stop. Hmm? And this is kind of what we do. How, how was it for you? Did you feel good? Was it calming? Was it relaxing? Yes. Um, we do this with multiple resources. For instance, now we incorporate bilateral stimulation to yoga poses, that, a yoga pose that is calming. We can do bilateral stimulation. Team of helpers, my companions, the people around that make me feel strong and safe and good. And we can invite the client to notice the feelings, where they are in the body, and use bilateral stimulation. Hmm? Once we have stabilized the client, because again, in EMDR therapy, we want to preserve. We want to get to the traumas, but we want to do it in a way that preserves the stability and the safety of the individual, OK? EMDR is not about catharsis. It's not about, you know, when you see those movies, there are some TV shows. Think about your mother, and you hit the pillow and say, I hate you, mom. And then, oh, you feel better. But you still hate your mom, right? So yeah, there is catharsis. But there is not integration. See the difference? So EMDR therapy is not about catharsis. EMDR therapy is about going into the memories of trauma and promote the assimilation and integration of such memories while helping the client stay present. And EMDR is very important to preserve something that we call dual attention. One foot in the past, one foot in the present. So it's not about reliving. It's not about, you know, relive the event. No. It's about think about it while you know that here you're safe. Here is not happening now. Here you know it's over. Here you know you're in California and you're safe. Right? Okay. Um, then eventually we go into identifying the memories of trauma and we identify, you know, what are the memories that are connected to the current issues. And with procedurals, of, specifically of EMDR, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do bilateral stimulation, eye movement. We're going to do butterfly hug. And we're going to think about the traumatic event while we're getting the stimulation, OK? That's the core of EMDR therapy. Once we get through these memories of trauma and the client can think about them and say, you know, how disturbing is it from zero to 10? Clients may say, 
This is zero. It doesn't bother me. Then we go into reinforcing positive networks. How do we do that? We identify a felt positive belief. Now the client can say, I am good enough. Okay. Think about the words, I am good enough, and the experience of trauma, and we do bilateral stimulation. So not only we work on decreasing the level of disturbance, but we work on reinforcing positive networks, positive information. Now I can think about that experience of trauma and know that I'm still good enough. I'm still lovable. And I'm not shameful. And I deserve good things. See, that's where we go. And then we go into the body. So EMDR therapy very much embraces the body. And that's one of the things that I love about EMDR. We go to the body. What does the body say? Because the body forms narratives, right? So now think about the experience of trauma and check your body from head to toe. Notice the body and what the body communicates to you, okay? And this is kind of the heart of EMDR therapy, okay? We're going to look at the past. We look at the present, but we envision the future in EMDR. This is the full treatment plan in EMDR therapy. We look at past memories of trauma. We look at current triggers, and we look at the future. What do I want? How do I want to feel? think when I'm in the presence of things that remind me of the traumatic event, okay? So now let me tell you about what's happening with the MDR around the world. Um, it's everywhere. <laughs> we have associations everywhere, and of course in Latin America. I left 25 years ago, my native country, with $900 in my pocket. That was it. That's all I had. But I had a mind and a heart full of dreams um, and full of possibilities. One of the good things about being the youngest, you're more adventurous, you know? So I came to the United States. Um, I was already, uh, I had a degree in psychology. And then, you know what happened after a while in Colombia? I joined a dance group and said, forget about psychology. Because I was formed in a very behavioral psychology, behaviorism. You know, I had to work with the Skinner rats. I don't know if anyone here had to do that. I had to do that, guys. And when I graduated in Columbia, it was five years of coursework plus two years of a thesis research. And can you imagine the disappointment of my family when I spent seven years getting a degree that then I didn't want? So I said, I just want to dance. <laughs> so they were not very happy. So then I came here, and then I'm trained in EMDR. And then I'm thinking, OK, this is what I was thinking. This is what I had in mind. And I reconnect it with, with psychology. So now we have you know, John Harton brought EMDR to Latin America. We're grateful for his work. And now is in all the countries in Latin America. But let me tell you, I'm going to show some images that may be disturbing for you. So please, with these images, if you need to protect yourself, if you need to look somewhere else, please do so. But I want to tell you about the reality of my native country, Colombia. I bet you don't know. Maybe you do. What's the country with the highest number of refugees in the world? And I can bet you the first country that came to your mind was Syria, wasn't it? Or any other countries that came to your mind? Huh? Couldn't hear. Germany, okay. Well, you know, I've been reading about this, and the country with the highest number of refugees is Colombia. And you know why? Because of the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. And what Colombia did in the face of adversity was to open up its borders, complete open borders. So millions of Venezuelans had moved to Colombia, and now Colombia has a significant crisis. So what we have done, so in, in 2013, 
I went back to support my native country and started to teach EMDR. But in Colombia, we have a word for many, many years, uh, guerrillas, and is 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 incredible to see very young kids that have joined the guerrillas and the armed forces in Colombia. The government just signed the peace agreement, but it's leaving this country with significant, significant ones that the drug business and the guerrillas have left. And this is what we see, homeless children, homeless children that are not receiving adequate care. We see soldiers that for so many years fought a battle and now there, there's no funding and there's no sufficient help for the people that the word left. Hmm? This is Botero, is one of our artists. And look what he paints. Uh, this really reflects the, um, the violence. And once again, these are some you know, very violent pictures. So please, if you get triggered by this, I invite you not to look at them. Um, but the death, the toll, that we have paid for this war of many years is significant. So I won't have the time to show some videos. I had videos of people. I'm gonna tell you the story of one, and I had the video. Um, this is a 21-year-old boy. This is a kid that was raped um, from the ages seven to 12 by someone close in his family, very close, but he would put a gun, gunpoint, and raped him every time. So this is a kid that became significantly depressed. And she, I'm sorry, he attempted suicide four times, and he was unsuccessful. So his plan was to go to a shopping center and kill people, hoping that he will be killed. He was ready, he already had a plan. Now, because we have in Colombia people that are trained in EMDR, one of the EMDR therapists worked with him. And in the video, he gets to talk about his experience. This was a kid that, wore, that was wearing black, black makeup, chains all over. If you see him now, the transformation is amazing. And this is a kid that was ready to kill other people. I mean, think about the shootings here, you know? The people that carry on such horrible things are probably people that have been very wounded themselves. And we're not looking at that. We're not looking at the underlying issue, which is unresolved trauma, the healing that the shooter and the people that get killed also need it the most. Hmm? We have um, another uh, testimonial of another 22-year-old who was severely bullied. And because he was gay, he was ostracized. And this is a boy that was developing an eating disorder. He had lost significant amount of weight. And you know in his testimonial what he says? When I started my first processing sessions, when we start to access the trauma, the first thing I felt was hunger. And he had stopped feeling hungry for years. He had stopped eating. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to go out. He didn't want to do anything. And he said, in such a beautiful way, he said, you know how I felt? It's like when you go home from school and you're tired and you have your backpack and you put it on your bed and you're in your safe place and oh, you feel just, oh, that's how I feel. So when you see the transformation, you know, you see that there are many routes towards healing. There are many ways to achieve and find healing. But I hope, you know, my hope for you today is to see that this is one way. Despite how much I spoke about trauma, my presentation is about hope. That we don't have to live 
with the I'm not good enough. We don't have to live with that I'm not lovable. We don't have to live with the shame. We don't have to live with the pain and the fear. But there are things that we can do. I have received EMDR therapy several years because I decided to go into the different corners of myself and heal. And I attribute who I am as a therapist today not only to the studies that I've done, but to the work that I've done in healing myself. So I'm going to allow a few, probably we only have two, three minutes for questions. So anyone that has any questions, I am right here. No questions? Yes. Um, how has or how can this work with incarcerated immigrant children? Oh, if we're allowed to get in. <laughs> Who has, uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, imagine the trauma these children experience when they're separated from their primary attachment figures. This is a trauma that also impacts identity formation because when trauma happens so early, not only impacts our ability to regulate emotions, tolerate emotions, but identity development, right? Our sense of who we are, our sense of self. So absolutely, these are children that are highly traumatized. Um, so EMDR can be used with these children. I, when I work with kids, you know, I work very systemically, so we have to work with the system. We have to work with, in this case, they don't have their primary caregivers, but we do have to work with the current caregivers, how they can promote safety, not only physical safety, but relational safety, emotional safety, and then initiate EMDR therapy. So I think it will be very promising. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. I think we need a mic right here. Thanks. A couple years ago, Bezel Vanderkock came here, and I recall him talking about this, but maybe it was in his book, Body Keeps the Score. He said that with EMDR, um, uh, soldiers and uh, people who had suffered PTSD in fighting seem to have score the highest in terms of the positive results with the MDR. And he said it was a little bit trickier and the results were less conclusive when it came to very young people who had experienced trauma at a very young age. And I noticed in one of your slides, you talked about the memory and the ability, the organic aspects of that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. About the work with kids, right? Yeah. Yes. So when you work with kids, thank you for that question. It's great. So when you work with children, of course, how they access the memories of trauma may be different. And we have to incorporate, we incorporate play, for instance. Hmm? We play with them. We create timelines. We create storybooks. We create memory boxes when we have rocks inside that represent the yucky things that happen to them. Uh, we make it very playful. Some of the experiences may be very implicit and happen before they had, you know, the brain had the ability to encode cognitive, you know, elements of the memory. But when we do the timelines, and the parents also tell the story, there are multiple protocols that we utilize. Sometimes there are protocols where the parent tells the story, if appropriate, and we do bilateral stimulation. There are certain procedural steps that we use to work with these kids. Um, children are able to access memories if we make it playful, like we do, for instance, a memory wand with ribbons, and each ribbon represents a yucky thing that happened, for instance. So we incorporate a lot of the element of play. In terms of research, uh, we do have research showing that EMDR is effective for children. What we need, though, is research with children with complex trauma, right? That's what we need. Now, anecdotally, most of us that are in the trenches working with kids like me, 
I work mostly with kids and teenagers. I work with reactive attachment disorder. You know, if you have work with reactive attachment disorder, you know these are very hardcore kids to work with. Now, EMDR therapy is not going to be a form of treatment that is going to last two months. No, it's going to, you're going to have to do some significant work. With reactive attachment, I worked, let's say, two, three years of heavy, good work, hmm? systemic work, because we have to work with the caregiver as well. How the caregiver can promote secure attachment with these children. But I have to say that I have children with severe trauma that I've been able to terminate treatment which with reactive attachment disorder before, you know, they go through years and years of unsuccessful therapy. Hmm? Now, we need to translate that into research, okay, which is what we don't have yet with this severe population, for instance. We know the therapists that specialize in this and working with these kids that is effective. But if, again, you need to incorporate a lot of elements into those A phases. Hmm? We have to work with dissociation. We have to work sometimes with different parts of the self. Some of these children present with structural dissociation, a division in the personality, way more complex. But can we still do the work? Absolutely. But then you need to have the skill level, the understanding of dissociation, attachment to work with this population, but you can be effective. Now we just have to translate it into research. Hmm? Yes. Mm -hmm. It works of oh, the yeah. caregiver being the support and being there to, you know, help the child through the trauma and the process. But what if the parent is not there yet? Or what if they're, re I don't want to say the word resistant, but they're in their own mind. Is, is the treatment as effective for the child if the caregiver or the support system is just not ready or not recognizing? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. So what do we do with caregivers? I, it's not... Easy, and I always start from a place of compassion with caregivers. I know they're doing their very best. It is important that the younger the child, the, the younger the child, the, the, the more you need to work with the caregiver. Hmm? Now, there are several programs developed with EMDR that use a systemic approach to work with the caregiver systemically and slowly, gradually to help the caregiver you know, understand the process. We use an attachment-focused program that incorporates a lot of elements of, for instance, the, the circle of security, the ARC, you know, uh, programs, and help the caregiver first understand how is to parent from an attachment perspective, but then we go into helping the parent be able to regulate emotions and tolerate emotions because if as a parent, I cannot tolerate my anger. There's no way I can tolerate the anger of my child. So I need to start with the caregiver, then working dyadically with the child and the caregiver. It's a whole program that works wonders. However, that's not always possible. And I always use MacGyver style. I don't know if you remember MacGyver from the, all, the, all days. You know how MacGyver creates a bomb with toothpaste and a donut, right? And sometimes that's all I can do. All I have is me, myself, and I. But you know what? We still do the best we can. Is, this, is it going to slow down the process? Probably. But you know what? We can still impact these children, you know? And they can still process some of the memories and become more resilient. There was a study in Palestine with children with ongoing trauma. And what they found is that the processing of the trauma made them more resilient and able to deal with and face the current trauma. That was a great question. OK, well, I think I have to go. I will stay with you guys the whole day. <laughs> but. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you again for inviting me. It's a privilege to, to be here and be able to share with you my life journey. I dedicated so many years to this. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Anna. And